everyone, Dave here. Thank you for coming along to another episode of Legends of the Spire. This is the podcast that speaks to the former players and managers of Chesterfield Football Club. Now it's an interesting one this week, as in episode number 51, I spoke to Liam Graham. Now he was at Chesterfield between 2015 and 2017 under uh, Danny Wilson, played a handful of games for for the Spyrites, uh, had an interesting journey just to get here. Uh, He uh, kind of grew up in Australia, New Zealand, but then also lived for a while in places like Japan and playing in Italy as well. Uh, Got mixed up in a whole bunch of uh, match fixing, not him, uh, at Pro Patria in Italy and then ended up coming to Chesterfield uh, after a trial with us, uh, signing under Dean Saunders. Now, he ended up, due to registration problems, which we will also cover in the podcast, ended up playing under the names Tom Gerald and Jake Hudson before finally becoming Liam Graham for us uh, in the transfer window after he initially signed. Uh, He ended up having his New Zealand debut uh, at the same time as when he was at Chesterfield, so although it was uh, a pretty unsuccessful time for the club as a whole, uh, for him it meant that he became a panini sticker. So we'll all cover all of that stuff and more in the podcast. Um, it's really interesting listen this week, um, so I hope you all enjoy it. I am at Legends of the Spire on Facebook and Spire Legends on places like Twitter and Instagram. Uh, so please do get in touch. But here we are with episode number 51. It's an interesting globe trekking special this week. Uh, so I hope you all enjoy it. This is Liam Graham. interested actually because you are New Zealand international you're a New Zealand international but you were born in Australia yes yes I was born in Melbourne but I've got a Kiwi mum um she's got Croatian heritage and then my dad was born in Greenwich Scotland and emigrated to New Zealand when he was about 10 so he he sounds like a Kiwi and then depending on what day of the week it is he's either Scottish or a Kiwi so I mean it it, it fluctuates um flip into so I, yeah <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a mixture of everything, but it was easy just to say I'm from New Zealand because um, that's where all my family is. So that's sort of how that came about. Yeah. Would it, would it ever have been a, a choice of a different country? Or, or I suppose you don't really think about these things, do you? <laughs> um, I think it was because I was with New Zealand from the under 20s, I sort of had definitely more of an affiliation to sort of want to play for them internationally. But I'm sure if Australia had knocked on the door earlier, it would have put me um sort of you know a foot on each side so to speak to you know do I do that or do I not do it but um luckily luckily the decision was made for me um I suppose if you'd have gone Scotland you'd have ended up your air miles would have been ridiculous (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) yeah I mean the way that they're playing at the moment that would have been pretty cool yeah no it would and you've got Lyndon Dykes who is uh I would say Australian uh well he's Scottish but you know what I mean Um, yeah 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 um, <laughs> great and I read that I don't know if it was on your Wikipedia or somewhere else but it said you spent your youth like traveling all over the place is that right yeah no so I am um, I've lived in eight countries so so far I like to say I, f- I feel like I've been very nomadic um, so yeah born born in Melbourne and then we sort of jumped between Melbourne Sydney and Brisbane um, then when, when I was about seven we moved to Singapore spent three years in Singapore which was which was really cool um and then moved back to sydney for another three years and then over to auckland for about four years um then tokyo for a year and then over to italy just before my 18th birthday um and you might have you might have caught up with the storyline by that stage (laughs) wow that's yeah was that kind of you know family work and and things like that yeah purely, purely my dad's job purely just working in property development so it was just sort of um the company he was with was sort of just moving him around depending on the needs and wants of what they were doing. Um, And naturally we were all dragged along. Go along for the ride. Do you actually like appreciate, is that a a nice thing when you're growing up kind of because you get to see lots of new cultures and things, or I suppose this point where you just want to be like, come on, can we just settle somewhere? It's, it's a weird one. Cause like, obviously now like you meet a lot of people and most not, not many people have had that sort of an upbringing to me. It was just really normal. It's just like, you know, we might get sat down next week and told, right, boys, pack your bags. We're going to this new place. And you're like, Oh, okay. No problem. You say goodbye to your friends at school. And, and then that's it. You're on a plane somewhere else. So like, I think, 
I mean, it would have been nice to have had that sort of um, sort of more fixed childhood, but at the same time, uh, I wouldn't change anything. It was looking back on it, it was amazing to have been able to experience, like you say, those different cultures, um, and in some instances, different languages um, at such a young age. So where does sport come into all that then? Because I imagine you never you, you kind of have to pick things up then wherever you go. Was was like football always your thing, or were you? Yeah, like when when I when I speak to mum or whenever she sort of brings it up with family and friends, she said I was just always kicking stuff. You know, hopefully it was a football and not my brothers. But um, so so most of the time, um, in terms of sport, yeah, it was always it was always football at school, well, as we used to call it, it was soccer. But um, my uh, my cousins and that, and obviously in New Zealand, rugby rugby is the big sport. But all my cousins are you know six three, six five, six six, so. I didn't quite get the height gene, but definitely got um, the the kicking gene. So yeah, it was always probably the sport that I played the most. Absolutely. Yeah, and I've had another. Uh, I had Aaron Downs on the podcast, who's an Australian who played for Chesterfield. Uh, okay, way, way before you, but um, kind of he always talked about how you know everything is very sport orientated over there, and I suppose you end up doing lots of different sports don't you kind of naturally yeah absolutely they're like you we spend so much time outside in australia and new zealand and yeah there's so is there's either a racket or a ball or, or something like i think every lunchtime for almost a year i played rugby um to the point where they made the school jersey like a rugby jersey because of the amount of rips and sort of blood noses and stuff <laughs> these kids would come in barefoot muddy um, so yeah, I think the parents must have written some letters say we need more sturdy sort of school shirts because this is just getting ridiculous. Um, so uh, yeah, so yeah, sport sport is you know it, it's every weekend. It's sort of the life and blood of those places. At what point did you start to kind of think that you were pretty good and you actually might like get a career in something? Were you quite an early starter or was it a bit like no? I was I was definitely a late bloomer. I mean. Um, when I moved to New Zealand at, I think, 14 years old, I started playing for a team called Central United. And a lot of those boys were in sort of the New Zealand international youth sort of setup. Um, and I was never invited to be part of the team, unfortunately. But um, in a way, it worked out a lot better because I feel like those guys peaked very early. So we went to the Nike Cup in 2016 in Manchester. And um, some of those boys went on to play for Birmingham. I think another one went to Everton. But again, at the end of their sort of three-year youth team contracts, they had not that much to show for it. And then they inevitably just came back to New Zealand. Um, so I was definitely late, late in the picture. And who were you kind of first playing for then? Um, I think it's sort of, it was sort of towards the end of... Um, I've got to go back and think how old it was. I was about 16 and a half. And my dad basically came and said, you know, me, your mum and your younger brother, we're moving to Tokyo. And if you want to pursue football seriously, then you can go to a Japanese high school um, that's sort of affiliated with a private football club and go to training every day and, and see if you've got what it takes. And so obviously, and I said, absolutely. Um, you know, when, when can I go? And so got on a plane maybe a month later and then that was it so i went to a japanese there's like i think there were three or four international students all um you know they they were there just for the school and the experience i was there for the football so i was lumped in with the football and baseball kids and we go to school from nine to twelve get an hour's train um and then train for about three hours they were just uh, the training sessions were mental um but like but but brilliant so yeah i I couldn't really speak to many people for the first six months until my Japanese was, you know, half decent to hold a conversation. Um, and yeah, and I spent a year there and that was sort of the first time where people were like, yeah, I think, I think this guy has, has what it takes. Can you still speak a bit of Japanese? Can you do anything? Oh, maybe a few crude swear words, but um, I probably needed another year to like really reinforce or like, you know, like, cause it's such a, they speak backwards. So like they'd start with, you know, school to I am going. That's how they'd structure the sentence. Um, so just, just like a very different way of thinking. Um, yeah, so, so my Japanese is a bit rusty, but the other languages have um, had stuck. And where did you play on the pitch then during that period? Because you kind of was with us, you were kind of more um, kind of defence, kind of fullback, weren't you, if I'm right? And yeah, where, exactly. So definitely... Um, 
the the system they played was definitely more like a four two three one four four two sort of setup with some kind of diamond midfield. So I was typically right back or right centre back. I mean, you you could get away with being a slightly smaller centre back in Tokyo because they're they're all a little bit shorter. So you know, it suited me perfectly. Um, no no reason not to win all the headers, but um, but yeah. So I enjoyed I enjoyed a mixture of those two roles. And then you ended up in. Uh, with in is it Vicenza? Yeah, with Vicenza. That was um. So yeah, finished the year in Japan. They basically the the, the off season in Japan is like two weeks. That there, there's no concept of let's slow down and you know enjoy a bit of time off, recalibrate. It's like, all right, well you can have two weeks off and then we'll see you again. It's like no 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 no. We, I don't do that. I need I need to go on a holiday. So my family were my family were over in Croatia. Um. And I flew over there and I had a, I had a transiting flight through Rome and I had a missed call from an old coach, an old New Zealand coach. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, don't know what this guy wants. Um, I'll, I'll talk to him when I land in, in Split. And my parents picked me up in Split and said, oh, we've had a call from Steve. I said, oh, yeah, you know, I saw the missed call. Um, he said, you know, you can go on trial at a Serie B under 20 team tomorrow if you'd like. And I said, absolutely. So, you know, just thought I was getting away from this, you know, pretty grueling season in Japan. Um, went and bought some shin pads and a pair of boots and I was on a flight at 6.30 a.m. the next morning. Um, the club came and picked me up, drove me into the mountains and, um, and I trialed there. Basically, there was one guy that was meant to fill this slot and he didn't have a European passport. So the club had said, it's too hard to get his playing documents. We're not interested in him. Do you have anyone else that you can bring? And he was like, I think Liam's in Europe. I'll give him a call and see if he can come. And the timing of it was just, it, it, it aligned perfectly. Do you ever look back at this time and just think, you know, because you sound quite unfazed. At the time, you, you sound like you were really unfazed by it all. And just like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I'll do, I'll do a bit of that. And, I mean, do you ever look back and just think, that was a bit bonkers? And I think, I think yeah, absolutely. <laughs> In quiet moments, you know, with, with my parents or with family or friends over a glass of red wine or something, you think, yeah, that was, that was pretty crazy um but sort of tying back into that way that we were kind of raised just like moving around so it's like okay it's just a new country it's another new language you know um, what could go wrong um but yeah so it was basically yeah after, after that I literally had the stuff I went on holiday with so I had a small bag um and then yeah they they gave me they gave me a youth team a year a year's contract with the because their their youth system works it's either under 16s or under 20s the Alievi or the or the Primavera. So basically, I was with the under twenties and just turning eighteen, um, and lumped in with these two Aussie lads in a flat, um, and everyone else was Italian, basically. So again, it was sort of English at home, Italian everywhere else. Um, but yeah, like thinking back on it now, I, it was it was it was good from two perspectives. One sort of, you know, like you learn very quickly how how the world kind of works because you're kind of there by yourself very very exposed you know how do i do the laundry how do i wash dishes you know the like it sounds silly but like still very serious life problems for a for a freshly turned 18 year old um and then yeah it's i don't know the the ability to sort of grow um from that raw position instead of maybe having the the support of your family around you and it, it suited me very well so in a way i was probably just lucky um, that it did. Otherwise, you know, it might not have turned out so well. Yeah, and I suppose a lot of people would just, a lot of people would naturally talk themselves out of opportunities sometimes. You know, I know exactly that at some point they'd be like, oh, no, no, actually, I'd, I'm not sure about going to Italy, but it sounds like you're just like... <laughs> yeah, it had never, it had never, you know, like you, you grow up watching the Premier League and, you, and you're just like, okay, yeah, I, you know, I would love to play in England or on the Premier League or Championship. Um, it didn't really cross my mind ever to play in Italy. You know, when when I was in Japan, I was like, okay, maybe I maybe I'll try and turn pro in Japan, or or there might be something else that I could try and do in America because I think they sent they sent a few players over there. But yeah, it was kind of like I've landed here. Here's an opportunity. Why why would I not take it if this is what I've been trying to do? Yeah, and by looking at this, so your kind of debut was with Ascoli. Yes. So, so that was, we're talking kind of 2012 kind of time now, aren't we? I think. Yeah, that would have been early 2013. So um, we were, I sort of, because it's my first 
proper year in in the in a first in a first team city of B. So it was it was again that was a learning curve because I went from quite a professional club, but in like absolute financial turmoil. Um, I think the managers were getting sacked every couple of weeks. The sorry, Vicenza was relegated, um, and then trialed at Ascoli, and that was great. And then yeah, the I had a bit of trouble at the beginning, sort of getting up to speed with you know just men's football. I think in general, you know, it's so different from that level, and it's and again, it's different in the leagues as you go up, sort of the leagues. I think most players would tell you. Um, but yeah, I finally finally got my chance. We were. We were losing 5-0 at home to Hellas Verona. Um, <laughs> and they brought down, um, it was, it was, Ascoli has like one of those classic big ring Italian stadiums and losing 5-0 and I was on the bench and I was probably the only one still warm enough. I was like, come on, just put me on. Like, <laughs> it's now or never. And he called me over, you know, I, was, I think, you know, touched the ball however many times, had a couple of runs, a couple of passes. Um, and I was grinning ear to ear after the game. Um, and we actually had to be held back because our own fans were sort of protesting and throwing rocks and stuff at the police outside the ground because you be yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I, I was over the moon. I wanted to get out there and sort I of you know. on, uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Great game, guys. <laughs> yeah, no, so that was um yeah, I suppose all part of the experience really. Ellas imbattuta da nove partite con la voglia di aumentare il margine sull'Empoli per provare a evitare i playoff. Marchigiani con l'acqua alla gola, KO nelle ultime cinque e con soli 13 punti in 17 partite nel girone di ritorno. Occhio al suo destro e il vantaggio del Verona al settimo minuto, sempre lui. Stop educato, ancora cacciatore, cross teso dentro, grande colpo di testa, il raddoppio del Verona. Polito Gomez, la sua rincorsa, il destro 3 a 0. Martigno. La palla rimane pericolosamente nell'area di rigore, sempre Martigno fa quello che vuole e fa anche il 4-0. Cross, Gomez prova la sponda, Caccia, lo scavetto, 5-0. So you missed kind of then, the, it was like the 13-14 season, wasn't it, I think, that you like had one of the, that, the, the cruciate ligament injuries. Yeah, so I'd finished that season at Ascoli. Um, it was a it was a one year deal with the option for the second. And since they were relegated, and I'd sort of sort of towards the end of the season, I was playing quite well in all the reserve team games. I was pretty consistently on the bench, and I'd had you know my one five nil loss appearance. So I was sort of I felt like I could still make another second division club and try and really play my way into the team. Um, And I and I'd spent the off season training really hard. Came back first day of pre season. I was training with just a group of other players that some ex professional, most not. Um, and we were going to play a team called Carpi, who had just been promoted from the third division, and they went on to play in the Serie A for a couple of seasons. I think they're back in the second division now. Um, and the first day of this sort of one week pre season training, this guy just came to the side of me, and I heard three pops, um, and thought that doesn't feel right. Um, and yeah, a couple of weeks later, extra uh, the MRI, and they said, yeah, you've, you've you know completely ruptured your your ligament. Um, you you need surgery. And I said, excellent, yeah, that's great. Um, so that was yeah, that was that was not a great day, um, I have to say. But um, back to New Zealand for the surgery, and then yeah, it was just my parents were living in Dubai, so I spent the good part of four or five months there doing the rehab. Um, And then came back with a team called Savona briefly in the third division just to sort of get training again. Um, and, and then, yeah, I signed for Monza and then out on loan to Propatria the, the next season. These injuries, like I've spoken to a lot of players now and, and most of them have had <laughs> really bad injuries. Um, it kind of never happens at the right time, does it? But if you're... No. <laughs> start of your career uh it's just i mean it's it was it mentally difficult tough to get back over that or were you quite focused i think it was it was kind of one of those ones because in a way it's not right it's, it's not by any means a good injury but it is very much you know you do the surgery with a good surgeon you do the rehab right there's no real reason why you shouldn't be able to continue to play um And then obviously your your risk of re-injury is slightly higher, but that's just you know a risk you have to take. So I think mentally I was only ever sort of just concentrating on the end goal, which was just trying to play again. 
and play, you know, not not without any fear. Just, you know, if I need to go into a tackle as hard as I can, I just have to do it. If something bad happens, then I suppose, you know, it, it, it'll happen. And luckily it didn't. Um, and yeah, just, and again, like sort of the belief and trying to believe that you can play football, just believing that the injury isn't going to stop me um, and that I can, I can try and still do this. That was really sort of, I had my, I had my sort of self pity party for a couple of days when I got the MRI result. Um, and I did the same with the second injury, but, um, but after that, you've just got to get on with it. And Dubai sounds like a nice place to rehab. Yeah, I mean, of all places, of all places, the the warm weather and having the water there and the beach and sort of being able to do, you know, a few different bits than you might um, somewhere else. Yeah, there was there was certainly no complaints from my end, at least at least that part of the injury. <laughs> and yeah, so pro, pro patria is my Derbyshire accent saying. It's, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, that's no, absolutely fine, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you played like a handful of games, didn't you, for uh, for them? So was it nice to get kind of back to it? Yeah, so that was that was really good. I mean, it was good at the beginning because I sort of signed for Monza, went out on loan to them. I had a, I had a really nice conversation with the coach at Monza. He's like, I really like you, Liam, but realistically, you're not going to play that much for me. Um, you know, you'll be a good squad player. We'll get you in when we can, but you're by no means my starting right back. And I said, appreciate your honesty. Um, I've got the opportunity to go out on loan to the same in the same division, just obviously a, a worse club. And he said, 100%, you should go um and so the first coach that we had was great he well I don't know if he was great but he was great with me um played I think four four or five games he was fired um the second guy came in I think I played one or two games under him he was fired and then the third coach came in um he didn't play me at all and the fourth coach didn't play me either but the first the, the beginning was definitely great at the beginning of that season, it was great because I, I managed to get those those couple of games in my belt, and I was like, right, you know, finally, four four games in a row, I'm finally match fit, um, starting to sort of play a bit more of you know my kind of style of football, um, and then coaches fired, new guy came in, bit of a rearrange, he was fired, um, and then yeah, I don't know how much you've looked into that club that season, but we basically. You know, it might have been March time um, and I went out for my morning espresso reading the news and I saw there'd been a big, um, a big police operation in football. And I was like, oh, here we go. You know, Italy, match fixing, whatever. And I was like, and it had 50 managers, players and um, sort of directors and stuff that had been arrested. And I was like, you know, oh, this will be funny. Let me read this list. <laughs> and then I get down to sort of like alphabetically like P in terms of the teams or something. And I see three players the third manager we'd had that season and the sporting director all arrested for match fixing at Propatia. And I was just like, oh my God. Like, so obviously went into training and all the players are talking about it. Um, yeah, so they were basically, I think, I can't remember what, what mafia who was involved, but they were betting on not the result, but uh, the amount of goals that needed to be scored in, in the game. And so they were letting in like, you know, just disgraceful. There was a goalkeeper, a midfielder, and a centre. I think one of the midfielders came on one game and just backhand slapped someone on a corner. So he was given a red card kind of thing. So that's like the antics that they were up to. Anyway, so I, I think, I don't think too much happened. I think they were given a slap on the wrist, but it was just sort of the icing on the cake for what was going on um, at that club that season. When you look back on something like that, do you think, oh, actually, that did seem a bit odd? yeah happened. absolutely there are a few games where like we were looking at each other thinking this this isn't right like like he, he wasn't a great player to start with we were like even even a bad player couldn't purposely do that like it was sort of just a bit too far-fetched anyway so I'm, I'm glad that they were onto them so but yeah so how did you end up in the UK then well I think it was sort of that season Really, I'd went from sort of a really good youth team to Ascoli to injured to that season. And I was just like, Italy, yeah, like, you know, I, I looked at it as a sign that it was time to move on from Italy. Um, and, and my manager at the time sort of was like, OK, you know, I've got some connections in Spain. Let's go and look at some third division club in Spain. And I, was, I said, OK, that's absolutely fine. Um, but I went there and basically there was because it's so hot, they train at like eight or nine o'clock at night. So you've got the whole day. And I mean, when you're, when you're just a footballer and, you know, in hindsight, you know, you know, online university, which I did start later, but um, 
you know, you, all you want to do is play football, but you've got the whole day just to sort of sit around. And it didn't, it just didn't feel right or professional or, or you know, that, those kind of things. So um, through someone that he met, they basically said, oh, you know, there is an opportunity to go on trial at some clubs in the UK. Are you, you know, do you want to do that? I said, absolutely. You know, let me, you know, where, where the clubs I'll go, I'll play in any division. I just want to, you know, I just want to be playing football and in the, in the UK, even better. Um, and so I think it was sort of towards September time in 2015 that I went, I went to Coventry for two weeks which seemed uh, under Tony Mowbray, which seemed really promising. Um, but I think, again, they were looking, since I hadn't played since, I hadn't played a game since the previous year and I hadn't had a pre-season, um, they were looking for someone with a bit more match fitness, um, spent a bit of time at Peterborough. And then while I was at Peterborough, I, I got a call saying, you know, there's a, I think it might've been a reserves team match against Grimsby Town on a, on a Wednesday afternoon at the, at a, a chess field and so I said yeah I'll, I'll drive up after training um or, or whenever it was and, and come play in the game um I think we won one nil so um yeah so that was that was sort of the story there and then after that I think I spent another two weeks um doing a bit more of like a an official trial in terms of like being being a chess field and going to training with the guys so that was sort of dove, dovetailing into the UK and so it was, it was again very much like a Kind of like signing in Italy, you're at, you're at a, a dinner and someone says, "Oh, well, do you want to come to the UK?" I've, you know, I've just met this guy. I said, "Yeah, absolutely. Like, I'd, I'll come tomorrow." Like, so it was just very, very much like that. So again, it felt like, okay, this is the right place, the right time, um, and it's another opportunity to sort of go and pursue, pursue this dream. How does Chesterfield stack up then to Dubai and Italy and Japan? Um, <laughs> it was. <Why? laughs> <laughs> it was definitely uh, another, uh, yeah, just a very different place to what I'd experienced previously. Um, I have to say, I, I was camped out at uh, I think uh, Nonna's on Chatsworth Road, yeah. where because there's a lot of Italians in there, so I was sort of straight in there, so I could speak a bit of Italian and have my little espresso and whatever. Um, but I mean, like, yeah, it was really nice. the The area around Chesterfield as well, like the Peak District, is very much like New Zealand, so that. That in a way did feel um, very much like home, being able to you know, go for a drive on the weekend or Wednesday was always a day off, so you could always sort of plan to do something on Wednesday. And, um, yeah, so what was so was it Dean Saunders was in charge when you first? Yeah, so Dean, Dean Saunders was the manager when I signed, um, and then I think he only lasted about six weeks before he was sort of... Um, given his marching orders as well. And then, uh, yeah, and then Danny Wilson came in. Yeah, <laughs> again, like <laughs> flashbacks to lots of managers coming and going. It was weird, the whole Dean Saunders thing, because it seemed like he was hired on the back of a really good after-dinner speech. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the history about how he came. He was, he was really entertaining in an after-dinner speech or something, so they gave him a job. Because there was a brilliant, there was a, I had a brilliant season the year before. Um, and then, and so they signed, they hired him. Yeah. It didn't quite right. work. It didn't quite work out with Dean Saunders. No. Uh, but apparently his afternoon speeching was very good. Um, so that's something. He was, he was very good at giving speeches, but obviously there's fortunately a bit more to, uh, to football than, than good speeches. I bet, he had some, I bet he had some good stories and stuff like that. Um, yeah. yeah. And then, like say Danny Wilson then comes in charge. Um, and we kind of perked up a bit on Danny Wilson. Uh, Absolutely. Um, it, it seemed like he was probably quite harshly let go when he when he when he finally left. It seems like, and obviously he was a big Chesterfield legend as well. He um, played a lot of games for Chesterfield. So, what was it like under Danny Wilson? I think again, he he definitely Dean Saunders was very sort of like open in the dressing room, having a laugh. Um, and sort of that that might have worked in terms of relation re, re, relationship with the players, but maybe didn't quite translate to getting good results on the pitch. Whereas Danny Wilson, you know, he'd laugh at the right time, but when it came to being serious, it was it was it was serious. It was time to work. And if you didn't do the work, you know, you you wouldn't play basically. Um, but he was very much in survival mode. So guys like me that were on the periphery didn't get a look in which I completely understand, like, you know, as frustrating as it is, 
you know, you, you sit down, you say, should I be playing? Maybe not, because he's why why would he risk, you know, his job for the sake of me when he's got these tried and tested sort of, you know, professionals that have been playing in League One. Um and so yeah, yeah, I got the opportunity to go out on loan to Whitehawk in Conference South. And while that didn't while it sounds more like a hockey team, um, I kind of said, you know, it's the six weeks left or something, 15 games, you know, just go and do it um, and end the season on a high. So I went and did that. And, and that was actually quite nice. They were really nice guys. Um, I did miss a penalty in the semifinal playoff. But uh, apart from that, it, it was great. Well, this it was is a great couple of podcasts. You didn't even need to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's weird. Um, I'm sure you've got the same that like these moments in your life, you could just replay them. Yeah. sort of you know in in slow motion um yeah so that so that was good fun i think to danny that was like a a mark that i was really serious about wanting to play for him and so when i came back the next season um like very very much a better player um that's when he started involving me a lot more i was on the bench um and then yeah eventually got my got my debut against barry mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, actually, did you get your berry against, was it Wolves in the, in the like Johnson's paint trophy or something? Oh, uh, so no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it was, it was Wolves, Wolves under 20s. Yeah. So it must've been nice then finally getting you. Getting yeah, it, it was great. It was just sort of like, uh, I think, cause I basically, I, I was told two days before the preseason trip, I think they went to Portugal or Spain, um, that I wasn't traveling with the squad and, you know, that was, and I had to train with the youth team all week and that was not great to say the least. Um, and then they came back from that week. And I think there was a friendly against Sheffield Wednesday and there was 15 minutes to go. And Danny, he said, I go on Liam, here's your chance. And I was just like, you know what, you know, I'm, I'm playing. And so I, and I played, I think I played really well. And after that, even uh, the, the assistant manager came over and shook my hand. He said, really well done, Liam. Like, you know, after, after that week, you know, getting dropped and whatever, you know, you showed a lot of character. Um, and so, and so, yeah, getting the game against Wolves under my belt, which is probably, um, a, I wouldn't say a better way to do it because, you know, the game comes when the game comes, but it wasn't slightly less riding on it than the league, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, so it's like a soft, a soft introduction. I'm just going back to Portugal, going off on a complete tangent, but the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the fake raffle winner, did, did that go around the, did that go around the squad at all at the time? I, it, it, it rings a bell but but yeah there was there was some raffle and then the no one no one actually went or something yeah they kind of made it up <laughs> because they didn't they didn't want to give anyone a prize <laughs> so oh, God. that's uh that's not great yeah and th- there's another thing which there's a bit of a uh, an elephant in the room i suppose in terms of like when you played in the reserves you had to play on yeah. you played under like two different pseudonyms yeah, so that was... How did that... I, why did that all happen? <laughs> so essentially, and I still... I don't know how it happened to this day. I mean, you know, I was just there to try and play football. Um, my Somehow my papers, and I still don't really understand again how this can be so complicated. One of the clubs I was trialling at in Spain had apparently tried to initiate my signing process without my knowledge. Um, and so when Chesterfield went to contact... Propatria, my ex-club, Propatria said, we've sent Liam's papers to this other team in Spain. And I was like, well, papers are digital. You know, you don't, you know, they're not sent by carrier pigeon. You know, you can just, you send someone an email, or, you know, call someone and say, can you please email me or whatever. Um, but apparently since they had initiated that process, they, they couldn't sign me as just a free sort of loan or like a free transfer. I had to wait till the next official window. And then enters my various sort of pseudonyms where I don't I, I can't remember who I was playing under, but some youth team player. Hopefully I did them justice. Um, and it didn't sort of ruin their careers. But uh, but yeah, that's sort of where that that came from. Yeah, I've got the names. So you were you Tom Gerald. Yep. And you were Jake Hudson at one point. Yeah, Jake Hudson, that was the one. <laughs> were they real people or were they just made up names? I, I couldn't tell you. I, I was told they were youth team players. That's that's about as much as I could tell you. So I was yeah. I was. It's basically. I can't remember who uh, the chief exec was. Chris, maybe Chris, somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and he said, "Yeah, Liam, we can't we can't sign you officially, but you can play in reserve team games under 
under somebody else's name and, and I was like well you know I, I just want to play so if that's what I have to do because I couldn't I wasn't eligible to play first team football because I wasn't a registered player um, and so that was a really and then with the manager sort of you like to think you're slightly protected with the manager that signed you if he's still there but since he, when he was fired I felt very vulnerable to sort of I'm at a club with a new manager who doesn't want me there um, or it, maybe you know want me or not want me he, uh, he wasn't going to play me um, and I wasn't eligible to play so that was that was a really tough three months in in my first Derbyshire winter uh, you know um, I'm not used to it being 4 p.m and pitch black that was that was uh, that was interesting oh yeah that's proper Derbyshire that is <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and there were plenty of players around then who, I mean, there's still Lawrence Maguire, I think you played with, who was still at Chesterfield now. He was kind of around then. He was probably very young. Yeah, that might have been, that might have been his sort of first season with the with the first team as well, I think. And yeah, Loz, um, Jake Beasley, who's gone on to do some pretty cool things as well. I think he's at Blackpool now. Mm-hmm. Been loosely following him. Yeah. Um, I can't think of any of the... You know, Jake Jake Hudson, if he's no, I don't. Um, very tough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no. So was, I think that was great for Lars, and I think he got his debut this for the same season that I did as well. Um, and um, obviously, didn't hasn't hasn't reached the heights that his brother has, but still, I thought he was a, a really sound guy um, and a good footballer. So I'm glad to hear he's still playing. Yeah, and he's still he's still doing well. We we all like Lars Um Yeah. So yeah, league debut was again very, wasn't it? Yeah. So how? So and you managed to play. You played kind of what three, four games, league games, I think, something like that. Yeah. So it was. Um, I think it was the Thursday or the Friday before the game, and Dion was sort of playing left back, and he basically pulled up at training injured, and we started looking around. And everyone was looking at me. I was like, oh no, he's not going to choose me. And he, sure enough, he pulled me over and said, Liam, you're going to start tomorrow left back. And I said, okay, let's like, let's go. Let's, you know, this is, this is amazing. Um, and I think within the first couple of minutes, their winger had sort of taken me on and tried to put in a cross and I got a block in and I, was thinking, I looked up at the clock and had, you know, two minutes, 15 seconds. And I thought, you know, it's going to be a long afternoon. <laughs> um, but, but after that sort of, you, you get, you get in the swing of it and that was great. And yeah, I think there was, that was a great week because not only getting the debut on the Saturday, I got a text after the game from the then New Zealand coach, um, basically saying, you know, Liam, um, it's, God, I can't think of his name. Um, it'll come to me. Uh, basically saying, oh, Anthony Hudson. It's Anthony Hudson. Um, you know, are you free for a call tomorrow night? I said, you know, I'm free for a call right now. You know, just, um, he basically said, yeah, we've, I'd, I'd known that there was this tour to the US for the New Zealand team in preparation for their, final World Cup qualifiers and the Confederations Cup. Um, and that said, that asked me for the information, but I was part of like a wider squad of maybe 30 to 35 players just to have. But as soon as I got that debut, which was a week before they were meant to travel, he called me and said, I want you to come in and be my starting right wing back. Um, and then we had Tuesday night at home against Gillingham, um, three or draw. I think we, we conceded two late goals, which is really unfortunate. Doing that um, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Um, and then at home to Bradford on the Saturday, which was a which was a tough uh, one 0 loss because I think they're they're in quite good form at that stage. But sort of those three games in that one week um, blew the cobwebs out. And um, and then yeah, the playing against Mexico in in Nashville in front of I'd say thirty nine thousand nine hundred and fifty sort of Mexicans. It's amazing, you know, the middle of nowhere in the USA and just Mexicans coming out of the wazoo, just like just, you know, converging on the stadium. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was the Tennessee Titans NFL stadium. So, it's, you know, it's, it's massive. It's, way, it's, it's a lot bigger than the scale. I sort of understood why we played there when I saw the Mexican fans arriving at the game. So, you know, they take this stuff pretty seriously as well. Um, and that, and that, was an amazing, that was an amazing experience in itself. And then playing against America in Washington a couple of days later. So, yeah, I had that sort of across the space of two weeks. I'd, I'd played, you know, three games for Chesterfield and two games for New Zealand out of sort of nowhere. Um, and so that was pretty surreal, I think. So, Liam, it's been a couple of games under your belt. How have you found it so far, the sort of step up to League One football? Oh, it's been extremely exciting. Obviously, the, the first game is always just a good one to get through, and now I can try and sort of bring my own, you know, sort of brand of football to, to what the manager's doing with the team and 
saw a bit of that on on Tuesday night with Gillingham. Hopefully, I can continue to to keep playing. Yeah, what do you get? Because obviously, in uh, if you get like a cap for England, you actually get a cap. Do you do you get a cap for New Zealand or not? So you get your you get just the playing shirt, um, and then you have sort of the the two flags, the date, the location. So I've still I've got that shirt. Um, yeah, so that. I need. I still need to get a frame, but because of, because I'm still moving around so much, it's not it's not easy just to like you know carry you know the frame under one hand and the bag under the other. Well, you, t- you tell me, sure, you can walk through an airport with a <laughs> <laughs> national football. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fragile. Get out of my way, please. And you got kind of three, like three caps for New Zealand, was it? Uh, yeah. So I, I got four caps in the end. So I basically played played those two games, came back. I think I played away at Charlton. Playing away at the Valley was was really cool as well. Um, another one to loss, unfortunately. But um, I thought I thought we deserved a lot more. But um, and then yeah, we flew back for New Caledonia, first game in Auckland, and I hadn't been home for so long as well. So the fact that it was you know paid for by New Zealand, um, and then seeing all my family and friends at the game was pretty special. Um, and it was the first time the All Whites had played in Auckland for like I, they they told me how long it was, but it was like a, a good stint. Um, and so we yeah we won that game two 0 uh, flew over to New Caledonia instead of playing in the main city, they made us play three hours up in the middle of nowhere. So that, um, that was a fun bus ride up there. And then and then yeah, sort of rainy day. There was a there was a fifty fifty, and again the the mentality sticks. It's sort of you know, if the tackle's there to be made, you've got to go in. Um, I mean, in hindsight, I should have gone in a lot dirtier. I went in far too sort of honestly. Um, and yeah, we basically, we just kicked the ball at the same time. He sort of fell forward and I sort of, I don't know how to like popped up, so to speak. And when I landed, my, my leg just, my left leg stayed the same and my body kept rotating. And I felt my knee just, you know, like go like, woof, woof, like in and out. Um ignored that that had happened tried to go back on and play it and then you know, a couple of minutes later went up for a header and i landed and the same thing happened again so i was like okay it might, it might be time to uh to wave the white flag and uh, like even like now i'm i'm gutted right now so i can't imagine what you felt at the time when you'd just started to get to the i rhythm. think yeah it was uh, again it was like that feeling i'd finally proven that i deserved to be there um and like and like also really exciting to go in and say right you know Chesterfield has seen all these great players um in recent times that had then gone on to play in the championship or you know you know even like better you know other other international teams maybe um so I wanted to be part of that you know group of players and and obviously number one thing was not only play games but it was you know stay in the league and I really thought that, you know, I could have hopefully been part of a team that did. Um, so, yeah, I think for me, that was, that was, you know, super disappointing um, from a personal perspective and obviously disappointing the way the season ended up for, for the team and the fans anyway. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was pretty tough to swallow. Yeah. Well, what was it like kind of the, the – I remember, like, at the time, the atmosphere around the club was just, like you said, we, uh, a bit ago, we, we'd obviously had really a couple of really successful seasons on the Paul Cook and got to like playoffs and stuff. And then yeah. Dave Allen had basically decided to sell that squad, um, and kind of Paul Cook didn't want to reassemble another one. Hence, Dean Saunders came in and so like And then yeah. it kind of started this kind of spiral that then is just really hard to get out of. And we spent a good like five years in that spiral or something. As a, as like a player at that time, is do you do you kind of feel that and 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 kind of note that atmosphere and everything when it's all happening around that time yeah you can you can definitely sense the like the tension's palpable like i think there's a difference between like just you know general fan disappointment even even a team winning the league can lose a home game and it's it's disappointing but you know in the back of your mind okay you know it's it's a hiccup it's going to be fine whereas like you know when we started losing games it was like you know this, this is really serious. Like something, something needs to change either with us or somewhere else in the, in the food chain to sort of, you know, stop the bleed. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, and clearly, you know, they, we weren't, we weren't getting it right as a collective unit. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's definitely not something pleasant to be a part of. Um, but, you know, 
I think there are a lot of players willing to really try and fight and, and keep that club in League One and then and then obviously in League Two. Um, but now I see that you know Chesterfield is still on the edge of the playoffs. So he's hoping that um, that they hold on and uh, and can roll the dice. Yeah, let's hope so. There's always there's always hope. Which players were you kind of closest to then around that time? Who were the ones that you would, you know, go and have an espresso and nonsense with? Um, yeah, I managed to convert a few of the lads. You know, uh, Sam Morsey, I got him onto playing chess and having uh, having espressos with me after training at Nonna's. Um, guys like, and I still speak to Sam, uh, Liam O'Neill. I think he's at Cambridge now. I still, I still speak to Liam. He's he's down in London, um, I think, because their, their season's just finished. So I'll hopefully catch up with him next week for dinner or something. Um, and then Bolly, Bolly Aribi, he's out in Turkey playing... I think the team, he's at Ankara. I think they've just won the second division. Um, yeah, so he's, he's, yeah, he's been doing really, really well in his own right. Um, and then apart from that, I, I, think, I think the saddest thing was there was a really nice team environment, you know, like Ian Ebert, Sam Hurd, sort of Dan Gardner, Joe O'Shea, the guys that had been there a couple of seasons. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that was the biggest disappointment of it, that we weren't able to sort of convert that into, into results. There was a whole thing about um, this 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 kind of company that like sponsored Chesterfield or something or sponsored the youth team that was like this place like what were they called like Royal Pearl International or something. There was some kind of advertising hoarding or something, and it was linked right. to some guy or something. And you kind of your name got kind of mixed in with that in terms of like oh this guy's bought this player to the UK and it's linked to these people that are sponsoring something or other and something like that. And it was all a bit, so I, I'm kind of from the opinion, having spoken to over 50 footballers now that lots of things happen in football with owners and people and footballers just kind of get stuck in the middle of things. But I, I just wondered if there was anything, it's thoughts on Yeah, I, I can say with every degree of certainty that, yeah, I, I trialed and they offered me a contract. I signed it and I, and I, I mean, apart from my registration, you know, the, the mix up there, which was super frustrating. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was no, like, it's not like people were asking me about it. It's uh, no, it's something that I just don't know anything about. Yeah. I was just, I mean, yeah. If anything, I, if there's that happening in football, you know, it's, I, I suppose it's a, it might be a sad part of the game or I don't know how uh, people want to look at it. I know that, you know, from Italy, you know, you had all the match fixing and stuff, which is definitely still ingrained in their game. Um, so yeah, what whatever the owners and stuff were doing, you'd you'd, you'd have to ask them. But um, as, yeah, as far as I was aware, I yeah, I trialed. Dean Saunders liked me, and he he wanted to bring in his own players, and I was and I was one of them. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I can leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. It, it was yeah, it was just a strange thing at the time. Obviously, a lot of things were happening. We had Rafflegate and and things like that happened that with like the you know the, the fake person that won the trip to <laughs> trip to yeah 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 that does that 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 rings a bell that that definitely rings a bell um and that yeah that doesn't sound good at all. Yeah. That's fine. We'll leave all that there. We'll go back to more fun things again. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> what I wanted to talk about is you you are a panini sticker. Yeah, no, I, someone. Someone recently, because um, now I work as a I work as a design manager now. So I basically um, I went back to when I when I I came back and tried under Gary Caldwell, but he'd um, he'd signed a few right backs. So I, I, it was pretty clear the the message was you know you, you're not going to play here. So I went back to New Zealand, Auckland City, um, and I was back home with all my old mates. So I was just like you know what you know there's more to life than football and sort of the world is sending you all these messages about, you know, repeating ACL injuries. So, you know, quit while you're ahead. Um, did a degree in London, Bachelor of Real Estate, just like a very general property degree. Um, and I've been working this job. So we basically, when architects win big projects, they basically hire us to manage their design team. So it's the architects, structural engineers, acoustics, specialist lighting. And one of the, um, one of the graphic designers heard that I was on the project. He's a London-based company. And he, and he said, oh, you know, he sent me a private message. Oh, Liam, like, 
do you want to come and play for my five side team? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh, where do you play? And I was like, I was like, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I'll bring my boots next week and I'll come and kick about. And he was like, oh yeah, well, I knew who you were because I've got your, I've got your Panini sticker. <laughs> um, and so I still, I still play with those guys every Wednesday. It's, um, it's great fun. I, I've got your Panini sticker. <laughs> oh. I, I went on, e- a- I went on eBay and I have your Panini sticker. Uh, so amazing. So- it's, it's quite cool. You're sticking on the 468 in the uh, road, road to Russia 2018 stick around. You can still get it on eBay for like about £1.50. So you can still... That might, that might be everybody's Christmas present this year. <laughs> yeah, like I'd, imagine, I'd imagine not many were bought, so there's, there's probably... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I wonder what, what you were... I wonder if you were one of the rare ones in the sticker album or if you I wonder if you're one of the ones where you're like oh, I've got like 25 Liam Graham's <laughs> <laughs> you know they definitely weren't printing lots lots of me like that, that's probably one of the only certainties about that that road to that road to Russia yeah right. is it quite so if you look back now obviously I suppose it was like I mentioned it it must have been really disappointing that you you kind of you, you feel like you're getting to a point and you're getting those caps and then injury happens and stuff like that and obviously no one really gets to retire on on their own on their own terms a lot of the time no yeah exactly through injuries or, or things like that so was it quite hard to transition out of football or um i think i, I was lucky because i'd i sort of started doing an online degree at chesterfield mostly because you have so much spare time, you might as well try and do something a bit more positive with it than just drink espressos and read the newspaper. Um, and, and because of my dad's job, I'd always sort of gone home and heard him talk about work and, you know, his workmates. So I, I had a sort of career path, not mapped out, but at least something I was familiar with. Mm. Um, and so the first, yeah, the first three years were were pretty tough. It was sort of, every game I watched on TV or went to a stadium to watch, all I could think of was what the right back should have been doing and how much better I, I would have been doing it. You know, whether, whether that was true or not was irrelevant. So it was just sort of, um, so that, that was, that was really tough to get through. Um, but then, and also because when you're at university, I suppose you can't really dig your teeth into sort of having, having a job, you know, football was, even though it was like very short every day, it's very intense. It takes every ounce of your body, mind and soul to sort of like really, really do and do well. And so I sort of went to university and I just felt like I was going through the motions a bit. Um, and it would have been good to speak to the psychotherapist kind of guy because it, it would have been all normal feelings, but maybe um, the support in these teams doesn't exist like that at the moment. I think the PFA is really trying to sort of up the ante um, with that sort of stuff. But eventually sort of once once I was able to start working, um, you're kind of like, oh, you know, I'm turning 30 this year. Um, and so when I sort of look back at from 18 to now, it feels like I've had a lifetime packed into 10 years. Yeah. And now I'm sort of starting the, like the real next chapter. So I like, I'm, while it is really disappointing, um, it was still a massive blessing. And, you know, I just I'm like super happy that I was actually able to try and do something and, you know, met some amazing people, learned two languages and lived in, you know, five or so countries along the way. So it was, um, I would, I wouldn't change a thing, albeit, you know, the, the two knee injuries went tremendous, but, um, but apart from that, yeah. And, and you got to play and you got to kind of get your dream and play for Chesterfield. I mean, New Zealand. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like you know, forget about forget about forget about that Panini sticker, mate. It's um, they should have they should have had an equivalent Chesterfield one, or as a uh, as some as some fans affectionately told me, Ches Vegas. Vegas, yeah, yeah. Ches Vegas. <laughs> so, so you're in London now, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm so I'm in London at the moment. Um, and yes, yeah, so I was. I mean. I'll be here for the next little while. I tend, I tend to jump around. So I've been here coming on sort of three and a half, four years um, and, and pretty settled and, and, and enjoying it. So um, we'll see, we'll see what the future holds for me. Um, and say it could be, it could be another random phone call and I'll be off to the next place. Like you just never really know. 
I was going to say, if I get in touch with you again in three years, you'll be like, oh, I'm in Sweden. <laughs> I, I could just about guarantee if you caught me in three years, I'd be somewhere else. 